Okay, let's uh, begin with prayer. Blessed Mother, join us in prayer as you join those first disciples gathered in the upper room as their hearts were kindled with the fire of the Holy Spirit. May our hearts be uh, rekindled by that same fire as we pray. Remember, O most gracious I've highlighted before uh, from John the Cross, Spiritual Canticle 13.2, which says God's visits and favors are generally in accord with the ardors of love and the intensity of yearning uh, that precede them. And so it's in John the Cross. It's not that these desires force the Lord to visit us or to come with his favors, uh, but desire does open our heart to receive St. Augustine has that image of, you know, waiting for what we ask for in prayer. By waiting, God causes that purse of our soul to get bigger, to expand as we wait, as we desire. And so, yeah, God's favors and visits generally in accord with the intensity of yearnings and ardor of love that precede them. So this important place of desire in the spiritual life. And St. Bernard, we can see very much as a doctor of desire. And so we'll uh, enter into his, his world, his spirituality, uh, and see how, yeah, our own desires can be kindled for the Lord more and more. In this light, the word sweetness comes up a lot in St. Bernard. You know, he's known as the mellifluous doctor which means the doctor flowing with honey. And so it's important to grasp what um, St. Bernard means by sweetness and what he doesn't mean. In um, the 19, early 1950s, Pope Pius XII uh, wrote a document uh, on St. Bernard. So I guess it was uh, 1951 and it was the no, not, it was 1953. It was on the anniversary of St. Bernard's death. So St. Bernard lives 1090 to 1153. So 1953 was the 400th year anniversary of St. Bernard's death. Pope Pius XII writes an encyclical called the Doctor of Mellifluous. And a year or two later, uh, it still hadn't appeared in English. And this is before there are, there's the Pauline media or the Paulist sisters who you know, did all the papal encyclicals and letters. And so the, um, the Trappists said, well, we should really get this published in English and transmit it. So they did that. And then they had Thomas Merton write a commentary on, on the Pope's words about um, Bernard. 
you know, some people like to distinguish the early Merton from the, the later Merton. Um, if that's necessary or not, I don't know, but um, whatever the case, that would be the early Merton <laughs> that he's writing this, and very insightful about St. Bernard. And um, he says, so Thomas Merton commenting on sweetness in St. Bernard uh, says this, the sweetness of St. Bernard remains clean because he seldom stops to think subjectively about sweetness. It is not at all self-conscious. It does not even spring up from any source within Bernard himself. It is an overflow from the goodness and mercy and charity of God. The honey in the doctrine of St. Bernard is not the cloying sweetness of a soul enclosed within itself, but the clean, fresh sweetness of the fields and the forest. Kind of like we have out here. <laughs> it is the breath of true life, of divine life, of supernatural charity, and of the Holy Spirit. It is the happy vitality of a soul made alive by self-sacrifice and the joy of a heart that lives no longer for itself, but for others, and above all, for God. In short, the honey of St. Bernard's doctrine is nothing else but the spiritual peace distilled in the silence of the monastic life. Yeah, so that's a nice account of sweetness. You know, objectively, God is sweet. Objectively, God is so good, so merciful, so abounding with grace and love and beauty. Objectively, he's, he's sweet. And so there is a sweetness in encountering him. As also, when we think of the scripture, St. Bernard says, the sweet and wholesome spiritual feast of sacred scripture. Right, and in itself, the encounter with the Lord has this objective sweetness, this goodness for us, this um, desirableness. And we know, you know, God himself is happy. And that's, it's interesting, St. Thomas is his last question on uh, God as one, where he's going through the attributes of God. The last question in that section, question 26, the first part of the Summa, is on God's blessedness, God's happiness. Uh, so, of course, to come into contact with the God who is sort of happiness himself, um, there overflows to us something of the sweetness of God himself and his beauty and his greatness. And so in St. Bernard, uh, we have the, this emphasis on desire being drawn up by the loveliness of the Lord. And we need that in our spiritual lives. We need that in our spiritual lives. Um, I don't know if you know Father Francis Martin. Um, he died in the odor of sanctity probably about five years ago or so. Scripture scholar, he began as a Trappist um, and then studying scripture in Rome. Um, he studied scripture in Rome. Eventually, he becomes the diocesan priest, or I forget what diocese. Um, but anyways, he was kind of involved in the early days of the charismatic renewal in the U.S., uh, but he, he taught at the Dominican House of Studies a number of times, so I, I got to take a number of classes with him. And he said uh, when he began as a Trappist, um, you know, he entered at age like 20, and he said he did nothing at all. He did nothing at all. And um, the first reading that, the first thing that his novice master gave him to read uh, was St. John of the Cross, Living Flame of Love. And you're like, wow, okay. You know, most people think you save that for like the end or something. Um, but no, that's the first thing he read. And he said um, like that made all the difference in his spiritual life. It marked the whole rest of his spiritual life, giving him kind of a concrete sense of where he was headed, where, what he was yearning for, desiring, going for, running after. And he noted too that desire is so important in the spiritual life, and so we, we need <laughs> we need this desire stirred up in a true way, a profound way, in a lasting way. And these works of you know Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, Living Flame of Love, Spiritual Canticle, they help do that. And God's visits and favors are generally in accord with the intensity of yearnings and the ardors of love uh, that precede them. 
Um, and so not as a cause and effect, but as a God's already at work in that desire and planting it, drawing us to himself. And so we uh, approach uh, St. Bernard in that uh, spirit. St. Bernard's really keen on the fact that, yeah, we knock and the door will be open. We, we seek, we'll find. Uh, we ask, we, we shall receive. Um, he, he imagines, he, uh, he considers uh, monks in his, his monastery, been faithful you know, through many years, um, but pining for more, pining for more. So he says, this is, uh, this is sermon number nine. He says, you know, he says, this is a you know, common sentiment of a, of a monk. I, I obey the commandments to the best of my ability, I hope. But in doing so, my soul thirsts like a parched land. If therefore he is to find my Holocaust acceptable, let him kiss me, I entreat, with the kiss of his mouth. All right, so this is where Bernard begins his commentary, because this is the beginning of the Song of Songs, the first verse, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. And yeah, that's the beginning of infused contemplation. That's the beginning of, of mystical prayer. Um, and so there, there's this call for that, there's this yearning for that. And uh, so Bernard continues here in Sermon 9, many of you, as I recall, he's speaking to his monks, are accustomed to complain to me in our private conversations about a similar languor and dryness of soul and ineptitude and dullness of mind, devoid of the power to penetrate the profound and subtle truths of God, devoid too entirely or for the most part of the sweetness of the spirit. All right, so, you know, in our monthly meetings, you come and <laughs> I hear you complaining. Uh, yeah, you're faithful, you're doing these things, um, but you know, something you, you yearn for more. What of these except that they yearn to be kissed? That they yearn is indeed evident. Their very mouths are open to inhale the spirit of wisdom and insight. Insight that they may attain to what they long for. Wisdom in order to savor what the mind apprehends. And he says, I cannot rest, the soul says, unless he kisses me with the kiss of his mouth. There's no question of ingratitude on my part. It is simply that I'm in love. The favors I have received are far above what I deserve, but they are less than what I long for. It is desire that drives me on, not reason. Please do not accuse me of presumption if I yield to this impulse of love. My shame indeed rebukes me, but love is stronger than all. I'm well aware that he is a king who loves justice, but headlong love does not wait for judgment. It is not chastened by advice, not shackled by shame, not subdued by reason. I ask, I crave, I implore. Let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. Don't you see that by his grace I have been for many years now careful to lead a chaste and sober life. I concentrate on, concentrate on spiritual studies, resist vices, pray often. I am watchful against temptations. I recount all my years and the bitterness of my soul. As far as I can judge, I have lived among the brethren without quarrel. I've been submissive to authority, responding to the beck and call of my superior. I do not covet goods, not mine. Rather, do I put forth myself and my goods at the service of others. With sweat on my brow, I eat my bread. Yet in all these practices, there is evidence only of my fidelity, nothing of enjoyment. <laughs> and what of these but that they entreat the Lord to be kissed with the kiss of his mouth? So yeah, this, this crying out to the Lord for more. In a way, you know, it is a, an asking for visits of the Lord. Reveal yourself, Lord, to us. Not that we ask for this or that favor. It can be as simple as, you know, Lord, I need more of you. Lord, I need more of you. And how the Lord decides to come and how what that more is going to look like, we live up to the Lord. But yeah, a beautiful prayer. Lord, I need, I need more of you. Uh, Father Romana Cesario, one of our Dominican fathers uh, and, and professors, um, 
I guess then he would he was known for during certain seasons of the liturgical year, and in, in the intercessions he would pray for you know Lord give us the graces of the season, you know give us the graces of Easter. So to ask for that, yearn for that, seek that with mouths uh, open, panting for the Lord. And the Lord does draw us after himself. He does that with the fragrance of Christ. So another big theme in Christ, in in St. Bernard, is Christ's fragrance. And we catch Christ's fragrance in the Old Testament, in the Psalms. We catch the fragrance of Christ as we meditate on the Gospels. So that fragrance of Christ captures, you know, that, that more of our contact with the Lord. It's not just this concrete knowledge. Uh, there's something more. There's that uno se que, that I don't know what, beyond our stammering, beyond our words. That's something more that draws us on. That's the fragrance of Christ. And uh, where does this fragrance come from, St. Bernard says? It comes from the inner bridal chamber with the Lord. That's where the fragrance is, is coming from, exuding out, being uh, wafted in the wind towards us. Uh, that place of intimacy with the Lord, intimacy with the mystery of God as he is in himself. That fragrance that we catch, but we, we can't quite grasp, right? We can't bottle it up. Draw me after you and we shall run in the odor of your ointments. Um, verse three of the Song of Songs, one three. And so he, he sort of runs with that theme and speaks about the fragrance of Christ. He says about the fragrance of Christ, breathe it in. The sweetness it exudes is breathed in by faith, he says. He says, I thank you, Lord Jesus, who have deigned to allow me at least to sense that odor of that fragrance. He says, the righteous shall rejoice in the Lord, tasting and knowing what I only perceive by its fragrance, right? The righteous in heaven. They see the Lord face to face, uh, but I just catch a fragrance of that. He says, catch the fragrance of the mystery. This is all from Sermon 67. He says, uh, I experience this joy in just one line of the bride. My beloved is mine and I am him. I was, as it were, lapped in its fragrance. All right, so we, we ponder a passage of scripture it draws us up into its mystery and we're lapped in its fragrance. We're, we're caught up, uh, we're enwrapped in its fragrance, the mystery of Christ. <laughs> St. Gregor Nazianzus says, what is this mystery which is all around me? As he, he says that about the incarnation of Christ. You know, it's not just a mystery he's pondering from the past, uh, the mystery of Christ incarnate God with us. What is this mystery which is all around me? We're wrapped up in the mystery of the incarnation. As Christ continues to live in us, God dwells with us as Emmanuel. Simon Murren says of St. Bernard, his doctrine is basically the incarnation of Christ and our participation in that as his mystical body and how his life uh, flows to us. And we're, we're caught up more and more in the mystery of Christ, which is not in the past, but which is what is this mystery, which is all around me? It's the Lord and he's drawing us in the odor of his fragrance. And it's by faith that we breathe it in. So let's listen to St. Bernard on faith that receives this mystery of Christ as the mystery is in itself. We're going to hear some resonances with St. John of the Cross, with St. Thomas, right? St. Thomas, I said, faith terminates not in the propositions of faith, not just in the words of scripture. Faith terminates in the reality. The res, the mystery, the reality itself, God himself, faith attains to it, attains to him, pierces into the the mystery of God, to his heart. Faith is like that gold vase that's plated in silver that we have now, St. John of the Cross says. The mystery we have, but plated, plated in silver, the articles of faith. So we're going to hear the same uh, sense of faith in St. Bernard. He says... You know, just one, he says, believe and you have found him. And that, that's the power of faith. Believe and you have found him. Make the act of faith, you have found him. You've come into contact with him. You've touched him. And his mystery, as he is in himself. St. Bernard says, come then, this is Sermon 76, number six. Come then, follow, seek him. 
Do not let that unapproachable brightness and glory hold you back from seeking him or make you despair of finding him. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. Believe and you have found him. Believing is having found. The faithful know that Christ dwells in their hearts by faith. What could be nearer? Therefore, seek him confidently. Seek him faithfully. The Lord is good to the soul who seeks him. Seek him in your prayers. Follow him in your actions. Find him in faith. How can faith fail to find him? Faith reaches what is unreachable. Faith makes known what is unknown. Faith grasps what cannot be measured. Faith plumbs the uttermost depths and in a way encompasses even eternity itself in its wide embrace. And so that, that's the power of faith. It takes on the contours of God himself. It reaches what's unreachable, which is beyond our grasp. Faith reaches it, but behind the veil, hiddenness, right? Here's St. Bernard developing this theme uh, with respect to St. Mary Magdalene. This is from uh, Sermon 28. When Jesus said, do not touch me, he meant depend no longer on your fallible senses. Put your trust in the word. Get used to faith. Faith cannot be deceived. With the power to understand invisible truths, faith does not know the poverty of the senses. Faith transcends even the limits of human reason, the capacity of nature, the bounds of experience. <coughs> why do you ask the eye to do what it's not equipped to do? And why does the hand endeavor to examine things beyond its reach? Right, Mary Magdalene reaching out uh, to, to, to grasp onto Christ's feet. Why does the hand endeavor to examine things beyond its reach? What you may learn from these senses is of limited value, but faith will tell you of me without detracting from my greatness. Learn to receive with greater confidence, to follow with greater security whatever faith commends to you. Do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Jesus says this as if after he had ascended, he could be touched by her. And yet he could be touched by her after he ascended. He could be touched not by the hand, but by the heart. He could be touched not by the eye, but by desire. He could be touched not by the senses, but by faith. So this is the higher way that uh, St. Mary Magdalene is called to in this transition from her encounters with the earthly Jesus to the uh, Jesus ascended in glory, reigning from heaven, present and active in his church. Just one more passage on, on faith. Okay, so that he continues in Sermon 28. It's as if the Lord says, become beautiful by touching me. Live by faith and you are beautiful. In your beauty, you will touch my beauty all the more worthily with greater felicity. You will touch me with the hand of faith. You will touch me with the finger of desire. You will touch me with the embrace of love. We can hear there, faith, hope, and charity. You will touch me with the hand of faith. You will touch me with the finger of desire. You know, hope, reaching out in desire for things not yet possessed. God himself. Uh, you will touch me with the embrace of love, charity. And so that's a powerful thing about faith, hope, and charity, this direct contact it brings us in, into with the Lord, is that that's why, like, meditating on the life of Christ, it's not just a holy thing to do. It's something that makes you holy. Because you come into contact with the Holy One. All right, so our pondering on the Lord, our meditation... 
uh, on him. It's not just a holy thing that we do, but it makes us holy because we come into contact with him. We come into contact with him and his mysteries, right? So when it's you're having a, a tough t- day and you ponder Christ crucified, you're coming in contact with that energy with which he endured the cross and he imparts that dynamism to you as you ponder him on the cross, as your faith, hope, and charity uh, comes into contact with him on the cross. Sermon 79 Again, on faith and Mary having to grow in her faith, Mary Magdalene. Even the apostle's words, she must pass on beyond, St. Bernard says. Right? So even the creed, we have to receive, and the creed points us in the right direction, but it points us on to something more. The fragrance of Christ, the mystery of God, the I don't know what beyond our stammering. So this is Mary Magdalene running back and forth from the empty tomb, talking to the disciples, It was indeed necessary that as she passed by, she should meet those from whom she was to learn the truth, right? The apostles there, their proclamation. Yet she had to leave them behind. You know, not absolutely, not completely, but she does have to go beyond uh, their words. If she had not, she would not have found the one she sought. You can have no doubt that, that they themselves urged her to do so, for they did not preach themselves, but the Lord Jesus, Jesus himself who is without question above them and beyond them. It is for this reason that he says, come to me, all you who desire me. But since the Lord Jesus has had passed by in his resurrection and had passed beyond in his ascension, she too could not rest content with passing by, but had to pass beyond in faith and devotion and follow him even to heaven. She had left herself behind, abiding in faith, which she had not yet come in fact. Right? Faith follows Christ into heaven. He says, it's the Lord is touched not by the heart. I'm sorry. It's touched not by the hand, but by the heart, not by the eye, but by desire. Touched by, not by the senses, but by faith. In its deep and mystical breast, Faith can grasp what is the length and breadth and height and depth. What eye cannot see, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man conceived is born within itself by faith. So the deep mystical breast of faith uh, receives the Lord, follows him, comes into contact with him, remains in contact with him. So I just wanted to bring in just the, another you know, perspective on faith. It rings, rings true with what we, we've heard, but just another way to elaborate on it. And for St. Bernard, the seeking of God is very much a seeking of the word. It's a seeking uh, through praying the scriptures. We find in St. Bernard very much a mysticism of the word. And oftentimes in St. Bernard, you don't know whether if, if word of God refers to the Bible or if it refers to the second person of the Trinity. And I think he intends there to be that ambiguity. Because the word, the second person of the Trinity, has become words in the scripture. And it is contact with the word himself uh, as we ponder the scriptures. You know, abide in me and I abide in you. If you keep, if you, uh, if you have my words and keep them, no, he abides in me and I in him. He it is who loves me. Uh, what's John 15, 7? There's something about abiding in the word, abiding in the word. Um, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you you wish and it'll be done for you. And in in abiding in the words of Jesus and the words of scripture, we come to abide in the word himself. That's why it's always good in our meditation times to at least start with scripture. And then that passage that you read, even if kind of the the rest of the, the time of prayer, you enter into more silence and stillness before the Lord, You know, that passage that you read and pondered, it still sets the atmosphere for that time of prayer. Even if you're not pondering each word, the words of scripture helps you to come and to abide in the word. And the passage you read, it remains there. Even as you abide in silence, it kind of sets that atmosphere, that that context. Abiding in the words of scripture, leading us to abiding in the word, the second person of the Trinity. 
And uh, they're very much related, the words of scripture and the word. And the word becomes weightier through deed, St. Bernard says. So it's about the words shaping us, the words of scripture shaping us to be more like the word. We become more and more attuned with the word. And that's our contact with the Lord. Sort of a mysticism of the word. St. Bernard says to pray and to seek the word are the same thing. And seeking the word also involves being sought by the word. Visits of the Lord. Kind of that two-way street of prayer, that back and forth. St. John Paul II says, The minister of the word must possess and pass on that knowledge of God, which is not a mere deposit of doctrinal truths, but a personal living experience of the mystery. That's what St. Bernard helps us to enter into. So when St. Bernard speaks about visits of, of the Lord, first of all, he says, you know, there, there are two helps we receive from heaven. Two helps we receive from heaven. One is the help of consolation, the joy of salvation. The other is the help of correction, trials. He says, we should learn to expect a twofold hope from, from above in the course of our spiritual life. Consolation and trials. One curbs the exterior trials. The other works within consolation. Um, trials curb arrogance. Consolation inspires trust. Trials beget humility. Consolation strengthens the faint-hearted. Trials make a man discreet. Consolations make him devout. Trials imbue a man with fear of God. The latter tempers that fear with the joy of salvation. As the words of scripture indicate, let my heart rejoice that it may fear your name and serve the Lord with fear and rejoice before him with reverence. So these visits of the Lord, they come in a, a form of Joy, consolation, but also, as he says elsewhere, a desolating fire. That's also a visit of the Lord. So we cry out, we ask for more of the Lord, and he comes as he wants to come. He comes in the way we, we need. Right? Do we need consolation or desolation? Well, we don't know. The Lord knows. <laughs> so we abandon ourselves you know, to where he has placed us, to where we are, um, and to receive him in whatever ways he wants to come. And so for St. Bernard, you know, the ways he comes to us are very, you know, even in the desire for prayer, that's the Lord coming to you. You know, St. Bernard is very Augustinian and very Pauline, actually, <laughs> that, you know, grace has to go before our good desires. So even a desire for the Lord is already the Lord coming to you, drawing you to himself. He comes to us in the sacraments. He comes to us in reading the scriptures, the fragrance of the word. He comes to us in our neighbor when we're, Inspired by um, a homily, St. Bernard says. We're inspired by the, the, the witness of another Christian. That's the visit of the Lord. So they're all very common parts of our Christian life that St. Bernard has in mind when he speaks about visits of the Lord and all very subtle. And it really is kind of all of it combined. And if we're attentive more and more to that, uh, yeah, we're attentive to all the ways the Lord wants to work in our lives, all the ways he wants to come and meet us and your neighbor and, and your sister. Um, in all these different ways. But a strong emphasis of St. Bernard is, is how God comes to us in his word. So just this last part of this morning's conference, we're going to uh, focus on that. How God speaks uh, through the word to us and how we speak in return. Uh, it's a living relationship through, through the word of God. Right? The word of God is so central to monastic life, to St. Bernard as, as a Cistercian, to you as Carmelites. Um, and so, yeah, to think about how, you know, we say God speaks to us through, through the scriptures, through the word, and he speaks to us in a personal way. Well, what does that look like? So here's how St. Bernard opens up that for us. Uh, this is sermon 32. And what he wants to say is as we ponder scripture, as we take it in and, and our holy thoughts, the holy thoughts that come from our meditation on the scripture, 
Uh, that's the Lord continuing to speak to you. So a very concrete way to think about this. St. Bernard says, uh, our meditations on the word, who is the bridegroom, right, you catch that kind of ambiguity, is it the scriptures or is it the second person of the Trinity? For our meditations on the word, who is the bridegroom, on his glory, his elegance, power, and majesty become, in a sense, his way of speaking to us, our meditations on the scriptures. And not only that, but when with eager minds we examine his rulings, the decrees from his own mouth, when we meditate on his law day and night, let us be assured that the bridegroom is present and that he speaks his message of happiness to us, lest our trial should prove more than we can bear. All right, so meditating on the law of the Lord day and night, when you do that, be assured the bridegroom is present and that he speaks his message to you. When you find yourself caught up in this kind of thinking, beware of seeing the thoughts as your own. You must rather acknowledge that he is present who said to the prophet, it is I announcing righteousness. Right? When you have these holy thoughts that follow from your pondering on scripture, beware of seeing those thoughts as just your own. Right? That'd be a Christian deism. It's just my own thoughts, my own insights into the scriptures. Uh, but to recognize the presence of him who is speaking that word to your heart, speaking uh, through the scriptures, that universal message to all mankind, speaking it to you in your situation, in your context, as you ponder it. Recognize the Lord is present in that work. You know, it doesn't mean everything that follows then you kind of say is infallible and you put the stamp of the Holy Spirit on. You know, I'm going to be the next queen of England or something. Um, <laughs> But, um, but to not lose sight of, yeah, the Lord is at work in our ponderings on the scripture. He's guiding our thoughts. He's speaking through the scriptures in a personal way to us in, in that way. Right? It's like St. John of the Cross, a successive locution. It's your own thoughts that are at work, but uh, the hand of the Lord is guiding you. You, know, you have the, the substantial locutions, formal locutions, and successive locutions. And successive locutions are very common. I think, you know, in homily preparation, a homily well-prepared, it's often a successive locution. You're using your thoughts, but there's a hand guiding you, an anointing upon your preparation. Um, and in your pondering of the scriptures, when your thoughts are anointed and a hand is guiding you, that's the hand of the Lord. So to recognize his presence. When we meditate on his law day and night, let us be assured the bridegroom is present and that he speaks his message of happiness to us. When you find yourself caught up in this kind of holy thinking, beware of seeing the thoughts as your own. You rationalist, you know? <laughs> beware of seeing the thoughts as your own. You must rather acknowledge that he is present who said to the prophet, it is I announcing righteousness. And then St. Bernard says, you know, we know what our own thoughts are like. <laughs> thoughts of discouragement, thoughts of uh, beating yourself up, thoughts of rash judgments towards us. We know what our own thoughts are like. Uh, so when our hearts, when we yield our hearts to wicked thoughts, St. Bernard says, the thoughts are our own. If we think on good things, on the other hand, it is God's word. Our own hearts produce the evil thoughts. Our hearts listen for the good thoughts because another is speaking them. Let me hear the heart says what God the Lord will speak for he will speak peace to his people. God accordingly utters words of peace, of goodness, of righteousness within us. We do not think these things of ourselves. We hear them in our interior. Yeah, so to recognize the presence of the Lord, to recognize his voice speaking his word to these, to us in these meditations on his word. That could really transform, right, our reading of the scriptures and how we approach it. And to see it with much more intimacy, um, see it as an expression of greater intimacy with the Lord or seeing how intimate the Lord is with us in guiding our minds and hearts as we ponder the scriptures. Be assured that the bridegroom is present and that he speaks his message of happiness to us, lest our trials should prove more than we can bear. An old Dominican, I'm sorry, an old Carthusian novice master, 
um, Dom Mary Paul Chaput. He was like the first major novice master at their foundation in Vermont. So I, he died probably in the early 2000s. But a Frenchman and um, Dom Andre Luth, do you know him? The Trappist? Um, He's a good spiritual writer, Dom Andre Luth, said of Dom Mary Paul Chaput that he was the greatest spiritual director in the Western Hemisphere. So I don't know who Dom Andre Luth knew in the Eastern Hemisphere, but he kind of intended by that. Um, but uh, Dom Mary Paul Chaput, a uh, great spiritual director, guide in the spiritual life. And uh, he would say that the scriptures were written for our consolation. The scriptures were written for our encouragement. And that's the main purpose in God giving us the scriptures. And you see in his name, Dom Mary Paul, he had a great devotion to St. Paul and uh, the Pauline letters, right? just like Elizabeth of the Trinity. And yeah, the Lord has written these primarily for our consolation, for our encouragement, to keep us uplifted as we follow him, to keep our eyes fixed on the promises he has for us and that we should lay hold of them in faith and hope and be uplifted by them. And we need them. To keep going after the Lord for our desire to remain kindled and kindled for things above. So St. Bernard says the same thing. Be assured the bridegroom is present and that he speaks his message of happiness to us through the scriptures, lest our trials should prove more than we can bear. The scriptures were written for our encouragement, for our, our consolation to receive those words from the Lord and that spirit. So that's one way we approach the scriptures and see God speaking to us through them. Here's, here's another way from St. Bernard where God speaks to us. Uh, in Contemplative Hunger by Father Haggerty, I was reading that um, a year or two ago and came across some passages where he speaks, where Haggerty says, one of the way that we speak to the Lord and he speaks to us is through desire. That there's a dialogue with the Lord on the level of desire, a back and forth with the Lord on the level of desire. And I thought, wow, that's, that's insightful. That opens some things up on thinking of what it means for God to speak to us and for us to speak to God. It happens on the level of desire. I thought, you know, Father Haggerty, that, that's pretty good. And then I read St. Bernard and I see he says the same thing. He says the effectus has its own language. The effectus, the, the, the desire, uh, love. Effectus has its own language. Now, Sermon 67 is all about that in St. Bernard. And this back and forth with the Lord on the level of desire, the Lord stirring up our desire, like that's him speaking to us, his movement in our heart, and us that return of that desire to the Lord is us speaking to him. Right, St. John of the Cross says in Living Flame 1 7 that God speaking to us is the effect he produces in the soul. So it's a similar sort of thing. The work that God does in the soul, the effect he produces in the soul, is, is the, he's, him speaking to us. And our listening to the Lord is us being receptive to that, available to that. All ears, the ear of the heart, open to receive that. And this is how the Carthusians can speak about, uh, they speak by silences. Uh, the beautiful book written by Carthusians. They speak by silences. You know, it sounds contradictory at first. But there is a speaking with the Lord in silence. Uh, it's not just abiding and opening the mind and heart to God. There's a back and forth in silence. A subtle back and forth on the level of effectus, the level of desire. So St. Bernard will say the speech of the word is an infusion of grace and loving kindness. And the speech of the soul, the speech of the soul is wonderment and gratitude and fervor of devotion and response to what the Lord uh, kindled up, the infusion of grace and kindled and, uh, and loving kindness. So let me read these words from Sermon 45, St. Bernard. The word is a spirit, the word, a capital so, okay, so that's the second person of the Trinity. The word is a spirit, the soul is a spirit. And they possess their own mode of speech and mode of presence in accord with their nature. The speech of the word is loving kindness. The speech of the soul is fervor of devotion. 
When the word therefore tells the soul you are beautiful and calls it friend, he infuses into it the power to love and to know it is loved in return. And when the soul addresses the Lord as beloved and praises his beauty, she is filled with admiration for his goodness and attributes to him without subterfuge or deceit the grace by which she loves. The speech of the word is an infusion of grace. The soul's response is wonder and thanksgiving. The more she feels her past and her loving, the more she gives in love and her wonder grows uh, even greater when he still exceeds her. All right, so this is beautiful back and forth with the Lord on the level of desire, him infusing grace, loving kindness into our souls and us responding with wonderment, thanksgiving, you know, wordless wonderment, wordless thanksgiving, wordless love and in return, sometimes with words, sometimes without words. But there's this deep dialogue, this deep back and forth with the Lord. So it really opens up before our eyes uh, the level which this kind of two-way street of prayer can happen. These visits of the Lord and our response, these touches of his grace and uh, this soul-filled response of wonderment, gratitude, thanksgiving, praise. Blessed Conchita, you know, Concepcion Cabrera de Armida, Mexican mystic who died, I think, in the 30s or maybe 40s, 1930s or 40s. She would often hear uh, formal locutions from the Lord. And she went a long time where she didn't receive any of those. So she starts complaining to the Lord. You know, Lord, how come you aren't speaking to me anymore? I don't hear your voice anymore. She started to complain with the Lord. And at one point, the Lord says to her, I am the word. I always speak. <coughs> right? He's the word he cannot but speak. Right? I am the Lord, I am the word, I always speak, but I have many ways of vibrating in the soul. Right? I have many ways of vibrating in the soul. That captures this as well. The Lord speaks to us not just in formal locutions or, or words we hear or read. He has many ways of vibrating in the soul. And to receive all those ways, enter into that dialogue of the heart. I am the word I always speak, but I have many ways of vibrating in the soul. And so to open our hearts to that, to recognize in the touches of his grace, to recognize the who that is behind them, the who that is present and a pressing in on us to bestow, pressing in on us for greater intimacy and communion with him. So one more, uh, one more angle on this. So another way that St. Bernard speaks about the word visiting us is that when we read the word of God, the promises in the scripture, and we, we're filled with conviction, confidence that this word applies to me, right? It's very much along the lines of, you know, claiming the promises God has for you in the scriptures. You know, he has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, Ephesians 1, you know, claim that for yourself in faith and in hope. And as the Lord fills you with conviction that this does apply to you, that's a visit of the word to you. That's being taught by the word, St. Bernard says. That confidence in being a child of God is another thing St. Bernard talks about. When you're filled with that parasia, so the Greek word in the New Testament is parasia, that boldness, that access we have to the Lord that open and free speech. You know, when you approach a king, you have to use formality in your speech. But in approaching God as Abba, as Daddy, we approach him with parasia, with boldness, confidence, with the free and open speech of a child. And when the Lord brings you up into that, that mystery, that's a visit of the word, St. Bernard says. So St. Bernard speaks a lot about confidence, conviction that the word stirs up, and that's a visit of him. And it's very much in line with the New Testament theme of parasia, of boldness, the confidence of the children of God. 
So he tells us to you know, lay hold of these promises of the scriptures. And at times when you're lay hold of yourself by these promises, that's a visit of the word as you're, you're, you're stirred up with confidence to claim these things. So St. Bernard says, Okay, yeah, there, you know, this is sermon, sermon 57 is a good example of this. Um, I'll just give you a few of the passages, uh, but there are some other places too. But um, we have a share in the blessings attested to by the scriptures, St. Bernard says, right? Those promises are ours as well through Christ. A share in its blessings. For in this respect, we are all universally and without distinction called to possess the blessings as our heritage. Hence, the psalmist dared to say to the Lord, your testimonies are my eternal heritage. They are the joy of my heart. A heritage, I think, by which he saw himself as a son of the father who is in heaven. For if a son, then an heir, an heir of God and a fellow heir with Christ. Well, that's, that's a good emphasis of ours today, you know, to, to lay claim to your identity as an adopted daughter of God, as a sister of Jesus Christ, as a temple of the Holy Spirit what God has won for you to lay claim of that in faith. You know, there can be profound psychological implications of that, seeing yourself as a daughter of God, as beloved. And so we do much to kind of enter into that reality because it's true. It's what God has won for us. And so we do all we can in faith and hope to enter into that reality. But sometimes we're brought to a deeper, profounder confidence that we couldn't have brought ourselves alone a deeper conviction that we couldn't have just stirred up on our own. That's a visit of the word. Drawing you. Uh, showing you, giving you a taste of these promises that we are inheriting. Uh, Bernard continues, why do we continue to defraud ourselves with these divine promises, commendations and testimonies? Why do we deprive ourselves of our paternal heritage? We fail to recall that he has in all these ways commended us. And he has uttered these testimonies in our favor as if he had not voluntarily made us his children by the word of truth. What of what the apostles said that the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are sons of God. So let me just close today with, with one example of this and how powerful it can be. The word of scripture coming to us as addressed personally to me Addressed it personally to you. And it doesn't always happen in the same way with the same intensity. But when the Lord really comes with you at, at a scripture verse and you're struck to your core to receive that as a visit of the word. The Lord Jesus is coming to, to, to confirm you, to strengthen you. So here, here, here's a good example of this. Um, so two and a half years ago, I was giving a retreat to a, a monastery um, of nuns. I won't say who or where, but far from here. Um, and, you know, I was doing my, my normal gig, you know, speaking about the mystical life and um, how we're all caught to this. And um, meeting with a sister, and, you know, it's during my conferences, um, I see some of the sisters are kind of really into it. Others are a little more standoffish. <laughs> Um, and so uh, one meeting I had with the novice mistress um, and just an incredible woman I had a great respect for her um, I do have great respect for her she joined when she was like 20 and when she joined this monastery the next youngest sister was the age of her grandma <laughs> um, so she really entered this monastery uh, with um, a sense that the Lord was going to turn things around um, and give new life to this monastery. So she, she entered just solely on trust. And for, you know, those first five years, you know, they had visitors, people who would try here and there, but she didn't have another sister close to her age uh, for like the first five years. And eventually people did start to come. So things are turning around. So anyway, the great respect, very heroic woman uh, living this life. She's probably been there 20 years now, 15, 20 years. Um, so anyway, she's a novice mistress now. And so uh, we have a meeting one time and then she comes to me and she says, you know what, Father, what you're saying, uh, it's, it's not how things are. 
what I'm saying about the mystical life and how we're called to it and uh, how all this is, is applies to us. She says, it's not, it's not how you say it is. And so, you know, she shared with me, you know, her, you know, certainly she's faithful, her faithfulness through the years, but she's not enjoying the taste. You know, she's like the monks we, we heard about in uh, Sermon 9. Yeah, faithful to the practices, doing this or that, but where's the enjoyment? What are, what, what are they doing? But yearning out, crying out for that kiss of the Lord. So anyway, so she said that I had a lot of respect for her, so it kind of like put me in my place or something. Um, and I'm like, oh man, am I doing something wrong here? Uh, and I'm like messing up because the, the other novices loved it. <laughs> Uh, some of the sisters loved it. They're like, yeah, what you're saying is right on. You know, this is great. We need more of this. Um, so I'm thinking, oh, no, am I, am I doing something wrong here? Anyway, so I, I left. So by the end of that retreat, here was my conclusion. I thought, well, we look at the Old Testament. We see that these prophets, like if you're given a word from the Lord to speak, you have to speak it, whether it's successful or not. Whether people say, yes, that rings true, or whether they say, uh, get out of here. <laughs> you have to uh, be like that fortified wall of brass that Jeremiah speaks of, that fortified wall of brass, and deliver the message uh, given from God to you for the sake of his people. And if yeah, a few might embrace it, but um, those few are important as well. So anyways, I, I kind of left that, uh, I left the monastery, that retreat kind of with that conviction with, okay, whether it, it's successful or not, that I, this is my message. I have nothing else to say. Uh, but I did kind of leave with like, you know, like a dog with the tail between his legs. <laughs> <laughs> so fast forward like a year and a half later. I had had some contact with the novice mistress through email uh, just on some other matters and just kind of exchanging prayer intentions, things like that. I mean, you know, we left on good terms and anything, but um, yeah, but her, her words, you know, she stands, she stood firm, firm on that. It's not as you say it is, the spiritual life. So a year and a half later, uh, she emails me and says, Father, can we talk? And, you know, we hadn't talked since <clears throat> um, the conferences. So I say, Sure. And so she, um, she says, she says, you know what? After, um, after your conferences, about three months later, uh, something happened. I said, okay, well, what happened? And then she said, she said, you know, it just wasn't your conferences, but there was the influence of maybe two or three other priests, uh, kind of in the subsequent months that kind of were pulling her along as well. Um, but here, here, here was the turning point. And basically, you know, the, okay, so here, here's the turning point. She said um, a few months after the conferences, she hadn't prayed like this before, but uh, she was before the Lord. And I can hear her kind of choking up a year and a half later. She's, she's still affected by this. Um, and she says, I was before the Lord. And I don't know why I did it, but I said, you know, Lord, what do you think of me? Lord, what do you think of me? And what she hears in the depths of her heart, my sister, my bride. Those words from scripture, words she had surely read many other times, those words, my sister, my bride, struck her to the core, shook her to the core, the foundation of her life, and a year and a half later, those words were still reverberating from her soul. My sister, my bride. That's the visit of the word when it comes with conviction like that. Confirmation, confidence. When it comes with power like that, the word of God is living and active, striking to the heart. When it strikes like that, it opens up things. That was a new beginning for her. Uh, living in the mystical life experiencing joy in the Lord in a new way. She said she just couldn't stop praying the rosary ever since then. And that's been her beautiful, she's just been running with uh, just new new depth and riches and joy and praying the rosary, uh, you know, the, the months and years, uh, year and a half that followed. That's a visit of the word. 
It comes as God wills, as he wills, when he wills, in the forms he wills. We open our heart to this living relationship to the Lord, to speak to our hearts whatever he has for us, to speak those words of encouragement to us when we need them, to speak those words that are so much that are received not so much in the intellect, but in the vibration of the heart. And that speaking by silences, desire, desire, heart to heart. So we pray uh, with all our hearts, the confidence and conviction of the children of God, as we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.